Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Futures Frame TV presented by Traces Dreams. I'm Elise Cruiser, your host for the Inequalities channel, and I'm very glad to introduce this week's program, which is a special edition. It's a recap program of all the different episodes that we ran this year since we started this program in August. It's the last episode of the year. Please enjoy the look at all these different subjects related to inequality. Ricardo. Tell me, um, you wrote a report together with your colleague uh, Nick Galasso a couple of years ago that was very influential on the subject of inequality. Um, could you tell me something about the statistic that became really famous and how you came about to invent that? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, using uh, a database that um, a Swiss bank was producing, Fred in Swiss, um, I could, I could just calculate that the 85 richest people in the world control as much wealth as the bottom half of the population. And uh, yeah, as you said, I mean, that, that kind of statistic. We published that report in January 2014, and uh, it was at a moment when inequality was coming into the public conversation, but it was not as uh, a, a sexy a topic as it is now. And uh, I guess... Uh, What, what, that, uh, what that paper with that specific statistic helped uh, put in the, in, the, in the global conversation was the fact that not only wealth is extremely concentrated, but that it, 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 it reflects and it reproduces political and economic systems that are very unfair. And I think uh, over the past uh, five years, ever since we, we published that paper, Uh, our understanding has evolved quite uh, a lot on, uh, on, on how, what are the mechanisms that, uh, that reproduce this uh, or, or protect or enhance these unfair systems, uh, be it campaign finance, being uh, monopolistic uh, structures in industries, being tax havens and tax evasion, tax solution, or just being basic corruption that goes unpunished. Uh, and it, it's happening in many places around the world. And then we start seeing now the consequences of, of, of those on first systems. I invited uh, Diego Castaneda to chat with me today about his work on inequalities in Mexico. Uh, Diego is one of the foremost scholars on inequality in Mexico. Uh, he's actually placed in Lund in Sweden currently, and he's an economic historian, as I said, working on one of the most uh, up-to-date topics, crises, and how they affect inequality uh, and the distribution. Diego, thanks for joining us today in this digital interview. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. I'm excited to do this. <laughs> Right, thank you. I'm excited as well. Diego, you're one of the most uh, well-read people, especially academics, which is kind of a nice attribute for an academic. We sometimes use you as a walking library. So um, I would <laughs> if you could uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what you're currently working on. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a reconstruction of the levels of inequality in Mexico from half the 19th century, let's say, to half the 20th century, that 100 year periods, let's say, because it's one of the formative periods in, uh, in the country. It's the period in which we experienced basically the construction of modern Mexico in, in different stages, all in the 19th century and then in, uh, in after the revolution and then, uh, let's say, the post-revolutionary regime. It has a lot of the themes that actually will still apply to, to Mexican inequality and to the, in general to the Mexican economy to, to, to this day because it, uh, it essentially is the birth of all these relationships of state capture, of the monopoly power that some businesses has, of the It's the birth of also the labor rights, it's the birth of the projects to bring uh, public health and public education to the, to the people. And, and you have all these political struggles and distributional forces go in all directions that uh, actually make it a very interesting period, a not so well-known period, because Mexican um, studies of inequality normally, I don't know, start from the 80s, 1980s to the, uh, to the present. And very few go back. I mean, some sometimes go to the 70s, to the 60s, but uh, 
the 50s backwards is actually pretty much unknown territory. So it was interesting. I'm here with uh, Luis Monroy Gomez Franco, a complicated last name, but very uh, uncomplicated researcher. Luis is currently a doctoral student at CUNY in New York, uh, although quarantine related, he's uh, back in Mexico at the moment. Is that right, Luis? Yeah. Great. Uh, and uh, I'm talking to Luis about social mobility in relation to inequality today, which is one of the topics that he's working on and that he's a great expert on and that he can probably tell us lots of interesting things that we hadn't uh, considered before. Luis, can you quickly explain to us what you're actually working on currently? So currently, as you were saying, I'm working on the relationship between social mobility and inequality, and in particular with one type of inequality, which is inequality of opportunity, understood as how much of our life outcomes are determined by circumstances that are preconditioned before we have any chance to decide on our lives. So I'm interested in analyzing how those factors that come predetermined for the individual affect his ability to move either upwards in the social scale or downwards which is what we understand as social mobility. Okay, and uh, what are some of these factors? What, what matters, for example? So, for example, in the Mexican case, which is the one that I'm studying more in depth, uh, the main factor driving the, the differences that are present even before any effort is put uh, by the individual is household wealth, uh, when the individual was 14 years old. So this means that the amount of assets or goods that were present in your household when you were a teenager, those have an effect on how well you do in your lifetime in terms of upwards to a better job or acquiring more goods or acquiring a better or a higher degree of education than your parents. I'm here today with Maximo Jaramillo. Maximo is one of the foremost inequality scholars in Mexico, and he's probably one of the most famous, although under his pseudonym, which he'll talk about <laughs> in, in a second. <laughs> okay. Maximo is a sociologist. He's a doctor in uh, sociology, but he has worked in the public sector for a long time, evaluating policies. Uh, currently, he's working in uh, civil society in a foundation called uh, Funda on the topic of tax redistribution, which he'll <laughs> also tell us about in a second. Max, can you start talking about uh, your gatitos contra la desigualdad, uh, cats against inequality, I guess, uh, which is by now world famous, especially uh, in this region. How, how did you come up with that and what, what is this page about? Well, thank you for the invitation, Alice. Hello, everybody. This web page, well, this, this is more like a social account in Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's called, like you say, Gatitos Contra Desigualdad, which means Kitties Against Inequality. And it's a project about trying to reach the, all the knowledge that is produced and research for people who don't usually read academic papers. We have this hypothesis that inequality is really related with perceptions of inequality. So our objective is try to modify the perceptions related with inequality, giving people a very easy information and, and simple to, to read and to understand so they can start to think or modify their, their perceptions about inequality and uh, after that to ask for more redistributive policies. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the, the main core of the project to uh, modify perceptions of inequality so people can ask for more redistributive uh, policies. The growth was very like organic, just all the followers sharing the information because we try to make very easy and the, the way we share it is just with memes, with uh, kitties and like a, a very precise data uh, about inequality. So I think, and also in the tweet or the Facebook post is the, the source of the data. So people that are now interested on inequality, they can read more in, like in the, in the paper or in the, I don't know, report of Oxfam, whatever. So they can like do more research about the, the topic. I mean, of course, I encourage you all to uh, check out the page because it's a beautiful page uh, or, well, I mean, beautiful features in Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We'll share the, the handle. The key of this page is or of this concept is that you have pictures of cats. Everybody likes pictures of cats. And then they're forced to consume information on inequality, right? 
Um, right. And this information is precise and is uh, is is always fact checked and is uh, is very accessible even for people who are not technically very versed in in the subject. And then for those yeah. that are interested in follow up on more information, they can go to the original source. It's a genius concept. It's very convincing. <laughs> and you have <laughs> you have like fifty thousand uh, people following you Facebook, right? That consume yeah. these cat pictures <laughs> with inequality. <laughs> Today I'm here with Patrick Inglis. Uh, Patrick is a researcher and uh, teaches sociology at the at Grinnell College in the U.S. He works on inequality and different angles of it, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about uh, what he's doing right now. Patrick, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, Patrick, you wrote a book recently called Narrow Fairways uh, that talks about elites and privilege in India. Could you tell me a little bit more about what the book is about? Yeah, so this was a the book came out last summer. It was a it was a 10-year ethnography that I conducted at these three private golf clubs in Bangalore, India, which is in the south of India. And and over these 10 years, I I got to know both the members of these golf clubs um, you know, and and the poor lower caste golf caddies. Um, who 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 carry who carry the golf sets or the golf bags of these members as they play rounds of golf? You know, they're five six hours at a time. And so over time, as I got to know the caddies and then got to know the members, I, I was able to sort of get to know more about their interactions. Uh, and a lot of the work on inequality and particularly poverty tends to study down or it studies up. And so what I I guess my my sort of novel contribution to the field, if if there is one, is that I I, I tried to study across this social economic chasm or divide, if you will. There's many lessons I, I took from it, but that's basically what I did. What I learned and what I what I describe in the in the book is that as tough as it is to be poor and lower caste in India, to to have these kinds of connections or the proximity to the rich. And there's a kind of ideal case or ideal type situation uh, for the poor lower caste golf caddies because, they, as I described in the book, every day they're working at the side of very, very wealthy, powerful people, uh, typically men in these in these private golf course settings. You know, as a result of globalization, economic liberalization, and the underfunding and disinvestment in healthcare, education, and jobs programs. Uh, these jobs at the side, literally right at the side, sometimes at the feet of these wealthy, wealthy people in India, becomes it becomes a means by which to survive. And some of the caddies do manage to come up, uh, and there's there's instances of social mobility. Um, although in 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 a lot of the cases that I studied, caddies did not have much of an opportunity to to really elevate much much beyond their sort of you know, meager existence in terms of the cash in hand that they would earn at, earn at the end of the day. That basically was was the study. And I'm here today with Gene Beeman, who is a professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Hey, Gene. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good, thank you. Uh, very nice to have you here. Uh, Gene, you wrote a book recently that's called Citizen Outsider. It's about the uh, Northern African migration or migrant population in France. And it describes the dynamics of uh, these immigrants in France. You start the book with an interesting sentence, which is the Republic makes no distinction among its children. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about the specific experience of these groups, how they relate to this sentence? Yeah, thank you. So um, the title, the full title of my book is Citizen Outsider, Children of North African Immigrants in France. And so I essentially focus on the children of North African immigrants or the descendants of migrants from former French colonies in the Maghreb or in North Africa, primarily Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. So I have this sort of um, manual best quote as an epigraph to kind of get at general ideology of French society that, you know, there is no, they don't recognize racial and ethnic identity categories or any sort of identity based community. And so the idea here is that, you know, as, as the quote indicates, that individuals are just seen as individuals and there's not any distinction made on the axes of race or ethnicity or religion, et cetera. However, that's, you know, that's sort of the rhetoric, but that's not the reality, right? And so my ethnography specifically focused on upwardly mobile uh, segment of the second generation population, um, people who are 
socioeconomically doing fine, financially doing fine, but still face uh, racial and ethnic exclusion solely because they're not white. And so essentially what I try to do in my book is talk about how the Republic actually does make these distinctions by focusing on this specific population that, that feels excluded. Today, I'm talking with Juan Carlos Moreno Brit, who is a professor of economics at the National University UNAM in Mexico. Um, Juan Carlos is an expert on inequality. He's been researching the topic for decades. He's also been working with the distribution-related issues at the UN Economic Commission for Latin America before going, coming to UNAM. And uh, he has some insights to share with us about the topic that uh, we hope will have uh, a broad view over the last couple of decades. Juan Carlos, welcome to the show. Pleasure. You forgot to say that I'm your friend. That's okay. You're also my, you're also my dear friend. Yes. <laughs> yes, very much. You're also one of the most uh, prolific writers. I mean, you've written more books and articles and reports than most people read in their lives. What's, inequality? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot to talk about uh, when That's we talk okay. about inequality. Uh, what, what do you think are the important aspects of inequality in Mexico today? I mean, you've been observing the topic for a longer period. Do you think it has changed over this time frame? And, and, and what do you think are its characteristics today? Well, I think we would have to look at, on at least two aspects. One is the, the data as such, whether inequality has changed. And that depends on the way you measure it. And you're an expert in measuring inequality, so I don't have to tell you how to measure inequality, but it depends. I mean, when you talk about inequality, are we talking about inequality in income, inequality in education, inequality in access to medicine, inequality in access to, I don't know, to a park, to a public space, to to, to peace at home, to violence, and, uh, to a space without violence. That's one thing. And the other is the perception of the importance of inequality. I would say that, that I think, Alicia Querida, that has changed a lot. I think that inequality used to be like something like, oh, well, you know, it happens and that's life and you just have to focus on poverty and inequality will just, um, it doesn't really matter because as long as all boats float, well, it doesn't matter whether there are big boats or small boats. And that I think has changed very much. So inequality, if you look at the data, the, the way of measuring it that I find it more, much more interesting, inequality in wealth, inequality in income, I think inequality has worsened in Mexico in the last 10, 15 years. But that's the bad part of the story. The good part of the story, I think that people are like you, obviously, you're an expert, you're in Mexico. I think Mexico has been blessed having you here as an academic. I, th I really think so. I think you've made a difference in the discussion in Mexico. Nexus and many other, Nexus is a, is a great review magazine, etc. And Alice has been publishing in it and educating people, I would like to think. And I believe that media, even the government, the um, civil service, the private sector, NGOs, they are much more aware of inequality as a problem, not as a thing that we just take it for granted. I think that in addition, now that we have pandemia with the, the COVID, etc., it's very blatant that Mexico and Latin America cannot grow. I, I know that your audience is not necessarily composed of economists. So economies, they have only two engines of growth. The external sector, that means exports, or the internal sector, that means Mexicans in the case of Mexico. So once we have a pandemic the size of this one, which is the worst crisis we've seen in 100 years, it's impossible to grow through exports. So the only way that we can grow, that we create employment, decent employments, nice wages, etc., is through the, a better distribution of income, decreasing inequality. So I think that inequality has become a major priority for any economy in Latin America and, or, say, emerging markets. If they want to develop, they have to tackle inequality. Today I'm here with Hugo Serrano Nanaya, who is a sociology professor at Lehigh University in the U.S. Hey, Hugo, how are you doing? Good. Thank you very much. I'm really excited about the invitation and the possibility to talk more about inequalities, the connection between race, class, gender in Latin America. Yeah, thanks for, for uh, being here with us and for telling us about these topics. These are your main subjects of, of research and uh, you're an outspoken expert on the relation between class and race and uh, how they play out specifically in Mexico, but in Latin America and, and in America probably more generally. Um, you wrote a book recently that exactly plays on those terms, plays literally. It's uh, called Privilege at Play. Uh, right. Can you tell us a little bit what the book is about? 
I started this project mainly looking at class. I was interested in understanding the upper classes in, in Mexico, the upper middle class and the upper class, trying to understand. My main concern was to look at how people express notions of class in a daily uh, basis. So I was interested in the sort of the mechanisms that people use to make boundaries, to keep boundaries, to recreate boundaries, and so on. Because I found that most of the of the body of work on class was on the one hand missing that the strata, and on the second, they were not elaborating on how exactly class boundaries operate on a daily basis. So that was my intention. So then I decided to focus on three highly exclusive golf uh, clubs in Mexico City. I knew how much was the membership, and therefore I knew that I was not dealing with middle classes. Those members who were able to pay these membership fees were not part of the middle class. They were part of the upper middle or upper class. When I went there to do interviews, to hang out with uh, folks, to ask questions about workers and so on, I realized that class was not, or the traditional, or even the most sophisticated class analysis that you can think of the discussion of culture, capital, or different forms of capital, and so on. Even that discussion was not enough to explain what people were telling me to explain social inequalities. That discussion was not enough, or those concepts were not enough to explain how people thought of workers and why workers were poor. They were also expressing something about diet. They were something expressing things about the inherent nature of workers and why they were poor had to do something with the natural disposition, they're, they're almost the, something like their spirit as in essence. There was something in the essence. And then the traditional class narrative and, and analysis and concepts are not good enough to explain these type of narratives. And then I developed in the, in the book the idea of the racialization of class, the way in which, unlike the United States uh, in, in Mexico, and I will argue also to some extent in Latin America, when people talk about race, it's never clear-cut color line, as it is in the United States. People express notions about construction workers or peasants. And those words that never speak of specific colors, they come preloaded with colors. In the same way that when they talk about good-looking members of society, that as well, it doesn't include some color uh, specification, but it comes preloaded with notions of who's good-looking and who's not, who's a construction worker and who's not. So in the, in the book, I developed this idea to try to explain why people who are talking about class and simultaneously talking about race, or how race and class collide and, and hide behind each other uh, when we are looking at this case. The book also brings the issue of gender, because I think that when we talk about inequalities, and there are multiple studies showing us how gender or poverty has a, a gender face. Women tend to be poorer than men all over the world. So in this case, I also explain how female members or, or the setup of the space and the organization of the clubs try to keep women through multiple small mechanisms, through uh, distribution of playing time, through internal torments, among many other things, try to put women down. But at the same time, how women, those highly privileged women, prefer most of the times not to engage in an open fight to try to rearrange the space because their own privilege in class and racial terms may be at play and they would prefer to keep that rather than to truly develop gender-free, gender-inclusive environment. Today I'm here with Dr. Michal Kozinski, who's a professor at Stanford Graduate Business School. He's a professor of uh, psychology. He has uh, studied for many years uh, computer science, psychology, psychometrics, several other related things. Uh, he's an expert on all things data, and we're happy to say hello and welcome Michal to our podcast today. How are you, Thank Michal? you for having me. I'm doing very, very well. A bit bored with my living room, but I guess that's the least of the problems that one it, can uh, have these days. It looks very pretty from the outside. Dr. Kozinski, you've been on most important media outlets in the world, speaking in parliaments in uh, all kinds of important settings. How does it make you feel to be on this uh, podcast finally? 
Well, finally, I reached uh, my goal to get onto your podcast. So I'm really grateful that after years of trying, I got a slot. <laughs> Thank you kindly. We've started a couple of weeks ago, but thanks for being here with us. Micha, you worked on a thing called Digital Footprint a couple of years ago, and you developed a, a way of figuring out how you can check personality by following a digital footprint. Could you say something about what the digital footprint is and how you came up with that connection? Well, first of all, I don't think that I figured it out. So industry, marketing industry has figured it out and they have been for many years essentially translating people's behavior, be it when browsing the websites on the internet or using their phones or being on social media and communicating with others and turning this behavior into very accurate predictions of their intimate psychological traits. And some of those predictions are maybe not that intrusive. For example, social network trying to predict what gender you have or you associate yourself with, and then trying to use this knowledge to optimize the content that is being shown to you. But of course, uh, you can imagine the same techniques being used in more disturbing ways, like, let's say, political marketing organizations trying to figure out your personality, intelligence, and other intimate psychological traits in order to target you with advertising that is going to be uh, most likely to make you, let's say, stay at home and not go to vote. And marketing companies have been doing it for a very long time. And at a certain point, when I got familiar with those methods, I realized that we don't really know how accurate those methods are. People who run those algorithms, such as Facebook, Google, and other big and small marketing companies, do not really want the general public policymakers, call us to know how accurate those predictions are. So I decided to essentially, in the context of my psychological lab, try to recreate some of those approaches, try to uh, get some volunteers to share the data with me and see how accurately my algorithms, algorithms that are trained on you know, my laptop, can predict their personality. And what we found is that those predictions were extremely accurate. Uh, and of course, you know, training those models on a few thousand volunteers uh, using my laptop uh, doesn't give you the same accuracy uh, as can be achieved by companies having access to data of billions of people and having you know all of the supercomputing power in the world. So uh, what we found is that those predictions are extremely accurate, uh, which uh, was a bit worrying. And I think the world, when we did this, I think it was 2013, took notice. And hopefully some of the damage that uh, later ensued was limited by the fact that governments and companies were kind of aware of this happening. Today I'm here with Elizabeth Chimpherson. Uh, Elizabeth is a sociologist and Russianist. Uh, and she works on elite studies, uh, researching the elite in Russia. Uh, Elizabeth is, like myself as well, a member of the Feminist International Network for uh, Elite Research. And we are looking forward to hearing all about uh, crazily rich Russians in a moment. Elizabeth, welcome to the program. Hello. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, Elizabeth, you wrote a book recently uh, that's called Rich Russians, that talks about, well, rich Russians. Um, can you can you say something about how you came into researching Russia and, and rich Russians? That is two separate stories. So I started learning Russian. Um, it, it was my first um, degree at university when I was 18, and that was quite random. I was thinking about learning Chinese, and then I was told that Chinese is four times more difficult than Russian. So I decided to go for the easy path, plus I combined it with history. I was always very interested in history, and Russian history is in no way boring. So that was uh, quite an easy decision. And then I'm from Austria, and Austria at the time they had already they had introduced student fees for a very brief time, not actually much money, but then they um, withdrew them because it didn't make sense uh, with the whole administration around it. And that was a time when I finished my first master's degree, started working and felt like I can't possibly uh, leave my university life behind. So I started doing another undergraduate, another master's uh, degree, and this time in sociology, and was very fascinated by all the studies, like for example, by Bourdieu and many others about uh, how so social structure and social inequality is being reproduced in a way we are not necessarily so aware about when we walk through life. 
And then what I, say, what I was thinking for a PhD, how could I combine my interests and my knowledge about Russia with my interest in, in studies of social reproduction and social inequality? And so it came that I tried to look at Russian society and use the produce and approaches that are usually only used on stable European societies and, and, and the US and try to apply them onto Russia and see to what extent they were applicable. I'm here today with Raul Bravo Aduna. Raul is a journalist by education. He's currently the editor of the Economics and Society uh, Resort of Nexus Magazine in Mexico City. Um, Nexus Magazine is all over Mexico, but uh, we are here in Mexico City. Raul, nice to have you here. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, I feel honored. So many amazing people have been in this show and I'm just like nobody, but I'm, I'm very happy to be, to be here and, and talk to you for a little bit. It, well, you might say that you uh, think that you're nobody in relation to this. Uh, that's because people don't usually see you because you're the behind the scenes embellisher of all the texts uh, that come out uh, that we write uh, us inequalitists. You're, you're basically the feather behind that makes them readable, right? I mean, you're the editor of <laughs> many of the contributors to this channel and to your magazine, writers. What is your secret in making us readable? Oh, wow. That's, that, that is a very peculiar question. I think I wasn't expecting something like that. Uh, and I, I kind of love what you're saying of uh, me being the little feather behind all of you guys. I wouldn't say that there's a secret in making you guys readable. I think there's a secret in acknowledging that any media outlet requires teamwork to properly flourish. The whole impulse behind economy and society when we started it about five years ago came from something very similar to what we're having right now. An interesting conversation after some beers at a pub or well, a cantina with some of these people who now are some of the greater inequalities of Mexico, like Diego Castañeda, like Luis Angel Monroy, Carlos Brown. And it's such a shame that... Uh, It has to be uh, like male dominated, but it, it, was it used to be. It used to be. <laughs> no, actually, uh, economy and society as, as as a media outlet started uh, with a very clear idea of equity, and we started with 50% female, 50% male authors. But let's say that the idea came from me listening to these guys, who of course were drunk, but were having fascinating conversations tremendously interesting conversations about inequality, about trickle-down economics, about economics as a fuel of knowledge and science. And I said, you know, why on earth does not come across our public conversation? Economists are tremendously boring, some of them aside, of course, but um, oh, it's, 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 it's boring and it's unintelligible and it's impossible to understand that it's marvelous, the science behind it, the principles that sort of sustain our world, the underlying principles that are sustaining everything that we're living in. And, you know, how is it possible that economists understand this and they are not communicating this? Like this, like this, like a conversation in a pub. And what I tried with them very, very much at the beginning, alongside great, great sociologists and great economists like Tesi Schlosser, Jose Ignacio Lanzagorta, Carla Paniagua, Camila Pasparedes, what, what I proposed to them was that they should aim at writing literary essays, speaking, talking about economics, speaking, talking about sociology, but thinking in literary terms while writing. And who would have known? It worked. You know, at the beginning, it was kind of tough to make them lose some of the academic and scholar jargon and some of the vices that one can find, of course, in every type of academic uh, technical writing. But it started working. I would say that that was the secret or the magic ingredient. Beer. And, of course, talking about it in colloquial normal normal ways. I am here today with Amalia Polido, who is an expert in uh, political violence and uh, its relation to elections and to political parties. 
Amalia is an assistant professor at the Political Studies Department of the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics, the CIDE, in Mexico City. Amalia, welcome to the program. Hello, Alice. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm really glad to be here and to spend some minutes talking about my research and other stuff. Yeah, thank you for being here with us. I mean, your topic is uh, clearly very important these days. I mean, any days, but these days there's a lot of talk about elections, about uh, possible relations to violence, where it comes about. Can you talk a little bit about a study that you uh, did a couple of years back in recently? <laughs> on the relationship between elections and campaign promises mm -hmm. and how this plays out? Well, so um, as you already mentioned, my, my research agenda focuses on the relationship between political violence and elections and political parties in Mexico and also in Latin America, but I specifically study Mexico. As, as you mentioned also, this is a really relevant topic, especially for the times we're living in Mexico. We just had elections uh, two days ago in Coahuila and Hidalgo, and we will have the biggest electoral process in 2021, when we will uh, elect governors, majors, local and federal deputies. So I think this topic, unfortunately, it's, it's really relevant, right? Because in Mexico, as in other countries, we are living a crisis in terms of how criminal organizations affect the um, decisions in politics, also how they can shape not just the selection of candidates, but also the implementation of public policies. So I think that's my main area. And as, as you already mentioned, I'm working on a project related to promise a campaign promise in Mexico, electoral accountability, and basically with two other colleagues, uh, Horacio Larregui and John Marshall, we are collecting information about all the promises that majors made in the past electoral process in 2018, and we are interested in know how they implement these promises once they are in power. So specifically how they are spending the budget related on, on, on what they promised in the past. So I think this is a really interesting question because in Mexico, accountability and linkage between citizens and politicians are very weak and we are like a young democracy. And this is also, we can see that also in terms of accountability. So in this project, we are looking at these promises and how they spend the budget and also how these have implications for future electoral performance. So basically the, the expectation is that if you promise something and then you didn't do anything about that promise, you will have some electoral cost, right? Or reputational cost in the future. So that's that's one of the, of the main projects. And the other one is specifically how Criminal organizations capture political processes, especially the selection of candidates. As you know, and maybe most of the of your audience should know, in Mexico we have a strong presence of specific type of violent non-state actor, that is criminal organizations. And these organizations, they not just only kill uh, politicians, but that they also look for other ways to influence politics. And one of that ways is cooperation dynamics, right? So basically they make some uh, negotiations or, or they can make some pressure on their party leaders to influence the selection candidate process. I'm here today with Paloma Villagomez. Uh, Paloma is a sociologist. Uh, she's currently doing a postdoc at the Institute for Social Inquiries uh, of the UNAM, the National University in Mexico. And uh, Paloma is an expert or a specialized researcher on food inequality. And uh, so today the conversation is going to be all about food and inequality, of course. So welcome, Paloma. Hi, Alice. Thank you for having me in such a kind and generous space. I'm a fan of your work. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm very fond of your work as well. You're also <laughs> a very prolific writer. I didn't say that, but we'll recommend some of the... Uh, readings in Spanish, uh, but if you read Spanish, uh, please go and check out the Paloma's readings in Nexos magazine. Paloma, how do you bring these two things together? I mean, we don't usually associate food with inequality. What do they have to do with each other? Well, it's a way of thinking about food that has become a lot more frequent than before. I think that it means actually to use your inequality glasses to see what resources are being uh, disputed in the food system. How are they being distributed? What are the social relations embedded in these chains of distribution and production? 
and consumption. It means to think about what's the power structure that organizes these relations that ultimately end up in the way you organize or the food ways of families and people all over the world, right? So it's just to see how social inequalities and economic inequalities translate into everyday food waste and all along the food system chain of production to consumption. And even beyond consumption, even the, the, the bodily experience of food, you know, and being healthy and being thin or overweighted or something, it's also part of the health field of food studies. It's on that realm. And it's, in sociology, it's not that common, but anthropology started um, studying this, how food was organized and how food organized societies, right? With the works of Mary Douglas and even Levi-Strauss, those are classics that showed how the way societies are organized are very related to the way we think about food and we eat food and we cook food. And, and th in those ways, there's some kind of, of embedded culture and in everyday practice um, for organizing food, or how we think about food in the everyday life, right? I'm here today with Francisco Robles. Francisco is a professor at the School of Communication and the Institute of Social Research at the University of Costa Rica. And uh, Francisco specializes on research on elites and inequality in terms of economic and political dimensions. Welcome, Francisco. Hi, Alice. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for uh, being here with us. Francisco, tell me something about the particularity of inequality research in Costa Rica or in Central America. And thank you for having this topic because, you know, like in the majority of the cases when we discuss about inequality in Latin America, like look at the specificities like in Central America. For instance, you know, like in, in your program, you have discussed like in the last couple of years, let's say two decades, in Latin America, the inequality has been reduced if we measure inequality based on Gini index. But for instance, in the case of Costa Rica, Costa Rica was one of the countries that this didn't happen in, in the last couple of years. And so this is kind of interesting. And also what we can see in Central America is we have also the countries with the biggest gap, for instance, in Panama, Honduras or Guatemala. And it's also uh, quite interesting to say that, for instance, that this has been like very disruptive for a country like Costa Rica, because in our in, in, in Costa Rica, we are like very, very equal country. We used to say oh, that Sweden we are of Latin America. Sweden, Sweden of <laughs> Latin America. We usually compare all ourselves with Uruguay, because Uruguay is the most like uh, equal country in Latin America. So we tend to think that we are also an Uruguayan country or Sweden of Latin America. But in the recent years, like the gap between the rich and the poor has increased. And now Costa Rica has one of the biggest number on Gini index. We are also working using like Piketty methodology to look at some specificities on, on this kind of thing. And we will uh, be able to share some data that shows that the inequality is even bigger when we look at the individuals and not just on the households. I am here today with uh, Dr. Andrea Binder. Andrea is a specialist in offshore finance, and she's uh, currently a fellow at the Global Public Policy Institute. And Andrea has also just won a very big prize for her dissertation that we will be talking about in a minute, the Current Foundation's German Dissertation Award 2020. Congratulations, Andrea, and thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Alice. Happy to be here. We would like to know from you something about offshore finance. It's a topic that is usually not very uh, high on the agenda of people that are not working with the subject or people that are engaged in legal activities or, or uh, research for, for uh, related topics. It, it sounds a little bit complicated, technical, even boring, and yet it's so important for everybody to understand what's going on really in this big topic, you researched the relationship between offshore tax finance and offshore banking. Is that correct? And what does that mean? Yeah. You're asking absolutely the right questions. I think offshore finance sounds incredibly boring. And I also think it's meant that way. 
because if it's boring and technical, no one wants to like actually engage with it. And so it can continue in this invisible mode in which it has been since the 1920s, if you look at offshore tax, and since the 1950s, if you look at offshore banking. And so I want to quickly explain those two terms. And also maybe just for people to catch on a little bit more, it's like it, they probably know the term of like a tax haven and you have this Caribbean islands, you know, the Cayman Islands. Or if you move a little bit more to Europe, then it's Luxembourg or Switzerland, who are usually known as these places where wealthy people either legally or illegally hold their money so that they don't have to ta be taxed at home. And then I think with a lot of like the leaks that people might have followed in the media, like we had the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. And at the very beginning, actually, there was the offshore leak. It was even called offshore before it got like bigger. And the journalists also understood somehow they need to tell a more catchy story uh, around it. And so essentially, we are looking at these places, although in a way, Offshore can be everywhere a little bit because what it really is in terms of characteristics is that in a certain jurisdiction, let's stay with the Cayman Islands for a second, you provide financial services to non-residents. And that's very important. The same financial services are not available to the residents of this jurisdiction. And probably that already like tells you that Why would you say, like, you can have access to these financial services if you're a non-resident, but you cannot if you are a resident? And that's because these services are usually very softly regulated. That's the second criterion. And they are also not taxed or taxed at a very low rate. And this combination of that the law of a certain jurisdiction, let's say the Cayman Islands, is only that law of this jurisdiction is differently applied to residents and non-residents in combination with the low taxation and the low regulation. If something's not regulated, you usually also don't have to document it. So these three criteria together make it invisible. So a lot of these financial flows are simply not on the books. And also because it's taking advantage of gaps between different laws in the country where the financial money is coming, where the money is coming from, and the jurisdiction where it's going to, if there's like some contradictions, then this is how you can use this to make your flows invisible. And there are different reasons why you would want to have financial flows invisible, like the obvious ones, you want to hide something that's illegal. So it's also used these offshore financial centers for money laundering or for tax evasion. So the legal part But actually, the offshore banking, which is also an important part that I looked at, is mostly legal. And so the illegal and the legal is merging in these places in a fascinating way. I have the great pleasure today of introducing you to Javier Gonzalez, if you don't know him yet. World famous economist and uh, the director of SUMA, which is the Laboratory for Education, Research and Innovation uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean based in Chile, working on a regional level. And he's also an affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge and uh, researching at the COES, which is the Center for Inequality Research at the University of Chile. Welcome, Javier, to our program. Thank you, Alice. Great to be here talking to you. Great to have you here today, where we want to talk about the context of inequality in Chile. We want to contextualize inequality in Chile to understand a little bit about uh, what social situation there currently is, where it comes from, and uh, what your field of expertise, which is uh, education, educational inequality, how that relates to the Chilean context. So to start off, could you explain what inequality looks like in Chile? How do we have to imagine that? Thank you, Alice. Well, first of all, we have to maybe contextualize the fact that Chile is in Latin America, as you know, is the most unequal region in the world. And Chile is quite an unequal country as well. Inequalities are basically based in very unjust institutions, politically, in the economic sphere, but also in the social sphere. And what is important to understand is that there are very long-standing inequalities, actually, There are quite interesting figures in the case of Chile. Not, not every country has long-standing figures. We have a study 
that measures the Gini coefficient, for example, for the last 150 years. And it shows how it has been oscillating around 0.5 to 0.6 Gini points in the last 150 years. And that basically what it shows you is that inequality is a structural issue. And it's also extremely high, sorry, right? So to explain that a Gini high. of five or six is, is very it's, high. It's extremely high by any comparative measure whatsoever. And that basically proves the fact that it's an inequality that is, is structural to our society. Of course, it comes, it's a long-standing problem from colonial times, but then into the Republic, into the independent Republic. But the important thing is that it's not only structural, but it has been a structured inequality. And here the elites play a key role. And as you know, a Chilean economist, Palma, has shown how the destiny of the top income are intertwined with the destiny of the bottom income classes, I mean, the lower classes. So sometimes we have a discourse, some groups in society have the discourse that, well, let's focus on poverty, let's leave rich people alone to create employment. Of course, I don't agree with that view, and that's why I'm also mentioning Palma's work, where he shows actually that where rich have more and are able to concentrate more income. That has a direct impact also on poverty. In the case of Chile, well, the 1%, the top uh, 1% income has more than 20% of GDP. And depending if we, we look at it before or after tax, it can go even in you know, 30% when we take capital gains. So it's an extremely unequal society, a long-standing unequal society, which has been exacerbated also by policies, especially by policies coming from the 80s, very neoliberal policies promoted by the Pinochet era, and which they were in a way modified during democracy after the 90s, but did not change the paradigm, a paradigm which basically is based on institutions that are very unequal, that are very focused on the poorest. And therefore, we have social policies which are quite fragmented and basically focused to, and very weak and very focused towards the poorest. And I think that has created a quite legitimate demand for most of the middle class and the lower and the middle class of the Chilean society to demand a change of logic or change of paradigm moving from, uh, from this logic of focalization of, of resources into the poor into universal services of social rights, basically. And that has created this very strong pressure into the political system to basically change the, the key institutions. Now, what are those key institutions, actually, that we should change? Of course, there, there are many. And as we know, they are the result of power struggles in which most of the time the elite has been able to, to impose to their benefit the type of institution, the rules of the game that really benefit them. And one of those areas which was very clear, and of course we can mention from property rights in extractive industries, etc. But one which is very clear, of course, is on taxation. Chile has a very low tax revenue, just above 20% of GDP, been long-standing, more or less, uh, tax revenues around 21% of GDP. And that is quite low, both today, if we compare, for example, with the OEC countries. But, but recently, I just published an uh, Oxford handbook, a study showing what happened, for example, with tax revenues when countries of the OECD had the same GDP per capita. So basically, what, what I was trying to prove there and argue is that actually, it's not an issue that has to be, do with let's say, Chilean's stage of development. It has to do with a political choice. So what we can see, actually, is the fact that even when countries in the OECD had the same GDP per capita in Chile today, they used to have much higher taxes than what we have today. And that has, of course, a direct effect on the capacity of the state to redistribute income and to reduce inequality. So in that sense, of course, we follow, and I'm thinking of Andy Esping Anderson's framework in terms of social democratic welfare states and more conservative welfare states. We're even more liberal than the usual liberal states, and we tend to have a very low impact 
on the redistribution. If we look at pre-tax versus post-tax and post-transfer, the effect of the state is very low, usually just a couple of uh, reductions in terms of Gini points. One thing is that we tax very little, but also is that it's quite regressive in the fact that most of the taxes come from VAT, so basically value-added tax, which is paid by the whole of the population and most proportionally paid by the poor. Whereas the income tax are lower, the brackets and the maximum tax rates for higher incomes are quite low, even comparatively. We cannot forget, and, and Piquete has done a great job in bringing again to the table and to a larger public the fact that both the UK and the US had maximum tax rates over 80% during the golden age of capitalism in the 40s, 60s. And therefore, in Chile, we can see that it's very regressive tax system. So the fact is, we have a high level of inequality. It has been decreasing in the last years, but still we're quite high, with a state which uh, does not have the capacity to, to collect enough taxes, basically because of the pressure of the lead to reduce to that capacity, and therefore... Then we have very focalized, very fragmented social policies instead of universal uh, social policy. And that creates several issues. Among those are, of course, education, which is another key institution to promote social mobility, to promote equality of opportunity. We hope you enjoyed this special episode. Uh, next year, that is next week, we are back with a brand new episode of Futures Frame TV, uh, where uh, I'll be talking to another a distinguished guest on subjects related to inequality. We hope you'll join us again and uh, we wish you a very nice end of the year and uh, festivities that you might be celebrating. Yeah. See you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.